and see if they can talk about it. And when you're going to write some shit, because ain't nobody writing it down in real time. You're writing it down after the time. That's right. Or is that history? Or is that your rendition and interpretation of a moment in history? Uh, Brother Smalls, good morning. It's, again, a pleasure to be here in your home. And uh, I, I want to look at uh, uh, history beginning with uh, uh, looking at the time after um, uh, after uh, the Confederacy, after the uh, Civil War, uh, 1865, looking at uh, the condition of uh, uh, Africans in America and uh, what, what were some of the first things that they put in place? What did they do? Looking at, let's say, take for an example, literacy, because it was uh, against the law to teach uh, black people to read and write but in a, a very short while, in a matter of 10 or 15 years, um, uh, they had uh, a literacy rate that was uh, almost uh, 50%. How did they do that? Uh, so I, can you well, speak on that? Well, the first thing, let's not use the white man's standard of what's literate or illiterate. So if you don't read or write English, they call you illiterate. But if you have an oral tradition, that is literacy. Okay. Um, and in your oral tradition, the concept of remembering is a significant part of your literacy. And so it's like if you look at the Bible, the Bible is oral history written down. The Torah is oral history written down. Uh, the Quran is oral history written down. All history is first oral, because nobody's writing history in real time. And no one is really writing history. They're writing um, incidents, aspects, and moments of history. Because you can't write history. Because that would be real time. Mm -hmm. And you, you could, that would mean if I wanted to see the history of the year 1840, I'd have to live out the entire year 1840. So mm -hmm. you can't do that. What we are calling history are episodes. Mm -hmm from what is, in essence, an epic. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at these episodes from the epic, which is history, and we're looking at these episodes from that epic, and we're calling it episodes history. We're hoping that the episodes you pick are the important ones because they then would be the ones that influence the rest of that historical period. And so long as we kind of clear on that, we got a sense of what we're talking about and we don't get caught up in the illusion of confusion that Dr. Jeffries talked about. Um, and let's look at the period as best we can because, you know, we don't have a lot of prep time for this mm -hmm. between 1865 and 1929 and see what African Americans were doing. And we are talking about the formerly enslaved Africans in the United States of America. That's who the African American is. And we must assert our identity. If you're from Jamaica, you're not an African-American. If you're born in Jamaica, if you're from Nigeria, you're not an African-American, you're a Nigerian-American. And if you're from Jamaica, you're a Jamaican-American. There's only one group whose legal title is African-American, and that's the formerly enslaved Africans in the United States of America, because that is a culture unto itself, that is a historical epic and episodes unto itself. And so we allow people to have us deny our identity as African-Americans while other Africans come from other places and try to assume that identity for economic reasons and political reasons, and yet do not ally themselves with the African-American. In most instances, uh, that those immigrant African community tend to ally themselves with the European-American not understanding what the historical relationship um, between the African American and the European American is, or the war, the cultural war and the spiritual war and the economic war and the political war that still exists between those two communities. So when you're an African from another place and you come and say, well, I can't get caught up in that, I'm here to make money, then you ally yourself with someone I'm at war with and wonder why I treat you a certain way. Mm -hmm. So you need to understand what you have just done. Besides disrespecting me in my country, something I would never do to you in your country, I would not go to Senegal 
and choose the side of the French against you. I would not come to Jamaica and choose the side of the Brits against you. So why would you come to America and choose the side of the white American, for whatever reason, economic, political, cultural, or whatever, against me and my interests, and then tell me I'm unwelcoming to you? I welcome my friends and my brothers and sisters. I do not welcome my enemies, whether they look like me or not. Let's get that clear up front. Um, and then let's look at some of the episodes in the epic history of African Americans in this country. Can, can you define one thing? You use the terminology, others come uh, to my country. I, can United you clarify that my country, my country as opposed this to... This is the African American country. There's no country called Africa. There's a race called Africa. There's a culture called Africa. There's a continent called Africa, but there is no country called Africa. And in the geopolitical definition of nationality, your nationality is the nation, state, or country that you belong to as a citizen and you pay taxes in. In that regard, the United States of America is the country of the African Americans. In the same way Jamaica or Trinidad or Haiti is the country of the Haitian, the Trinidadian, and Jamaican, and neither of them live in Africa. Okay, why are we on no, that well, I want to be clear, because see, people get this real confused. Someone from Trinidad will come and say I'm a Trinidadian, but then tell me why you want to be an American. Because mm -hmm. I am an American. American is the geopolitical definition. Mm -hmm. I am a citizen of the United States of America. And what people try not to understand, because our numbers are so large, that they think there would be, other blacks think they would be over, they'll be marginalized by us because they don't come with the tendency to merge with us. And so what happens when blacks come from other places, they tend to ally themselves with white people because that's where they can get the job. So they pretend, oh, you black people don't want us. And so that, no, you're there because you didn't come here to be a brother to me. You didn't come here to be a comrade to me. You didn't come to be an ally to me in my crisis. You came here because you were an economic refugee or a political refugee, but in most times you were an e economic refugee. And since the, the means of production and the economy of the United States of America is predominantly controlled by white Americans, that's who you'll ally yourself with. So don't make excuses about why you're doing it. Just tell the truth. Know the truth. Truth will set you free. And in fact, Malcolm told us that truth alone will set us free. So let's get the truth first. But Pete, I hear this discussion about nationality. My nationality is African-American. I'm an African, that's my racial identity. America is my geopolitical identity. Now, if you, and, and my ethnic identity is when I combine the two. African-American is my ethnocultural identity. Mm. But African alone is my racial identity. America is my geopolitical identity. So we understand that. Then we'll know how to look at our history and make it our ID tag. Can you also address why you're on that topic? <clears throat> uh, a lot of people, especially from the Caribbean and other places, will point out that they come here and they're able to do well. They, they have stores, they have businesses. But African Americans have been here all this time and uh, they don't seem to have that's accumulated that's wealth. True at all. That's not true. There's no nation in the world black as wealthy as the African American. So what are they talking about? That you got a store, and I'm the majority of the municipal workers in the city. I'm the majority of the postal workers in the city. I spend a trillion dollars a year. Your nation don't even make a trillion dollars a year that you come. So what the hell are you talking about? What people are trying to do is play a little shell game with you. Um, I own a grocery store that you shop at. You treat me like a human being. You don't say I'm a boy country because you don't live here. You come and shop at my store and treat me like a human being, but I can't even treat you like a human being in reference. Mm. I shop at your store when you don't even share your monies in my community. You don't build in my social community. You don't even come and go to my church. You establish your own church. No white community does that. When the Irish come to America, they go to whatever Catholic church or Protestant churches in the community they move in. When my brothers and sisters come from the continent or from the Caribbean, they set up their own separate Protestant church or their separate Catholic church, but they don't, or they'll go to the white Catholic church, but they won't come and make their home within the black church. 
right there. Tell me who's discriminating against whom. But mm -hmm. see, the thing is, you've come here not to partner with me. You've come here, you were brought here by the white man to partner with him. He granted you the visa. He granted you the green card. Why? He doesn't mm -hmm. need you. Or does he need you? He needed you for the cheap labor. He needed you to work in the industries we were working in because in the 60s, we broke their back. We broke their back politically. We broke their back economically. And they said, we'll reward you. You may have your civil rights bill. You may have your affirmative action laws. You may have disgraced us to the world, but we'll make sure you're unemployed. So we're gonna bring blacks in from the Caribbean, Philippines in from the Philippines, uh, Chinese from Taiwan. And then when that market got saturated, then they started bringing in the Latinos from all over Central South America to be the cheap labor force, to do the work that we have been doing in this nation all along, developing and moving up in, and to make sure that you use economics and unemployment as a way of defeating and reversing the victories that blacks had won during the Civil Rights War against you. And then our brothers and sisters, in their ignorance and their desperation, don't understand none of this. They just know they got a job. They don't understand why they would give them preference. Because they're not going to fight no white folks. They got no beef with the white folks. They got no historical relationship with white racism and white supremacy in America. They don't even know what we are angry about. And many times they ask us that. What are you angry about? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because in America, we went to war with the white man as the white man. That didn't happen in any Caribbean island or any African nation. After their enslavement and after their colonial enslavement, they tend to merge and migrate into that white culture and population, denouncing their culture. No, the, the Jamaicans, for an example, would say that they, um, uh, they fought, uh, they are Maroons. Uh, A they, small they portion wanted to... of Jamaica were Maroons. All of Jamaica were not Maroons. It was two main Maroon communities, and both of them signed, um, at least one of them under um, uh, Nanny, signed an agreement with the British to capture the runaway and return them back to the British in exchange for their independence. Um, and that was just a semi-independence. Most of Jamaicans were not in the Maroon community, and even today, most of Jamaicans don't even respect the Maroon community, which still exists to this day. I've been in that community. I've danced the Naya Bengi in every church in the hills of Jamaica. I've sat at the table at Mr. Henry Palace and helped broker a peace agreement between the seven families. I know more about the Maroons. And when I go among that community today, I'm greeted as a hero, a son, and a brother of that community. And they look at most of the other brothers and sisters in Jamaica as their enemy, and they, none of them would dare come up into those mountains after dark unless they had family up there. Even the taxi cabs will not take you after dark because the, 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 the everyday Jamaicans have no relationship with the Maroon community and they still treat them as marginalized um, Africanists, mm -hmm. Bush people. Mm -hmm. So when people get over here with us, they try to play the little game to give themselves an identity, but when they're at home, they're not in that identity. If you meet a true Maroon, they'll come over here to be our comrades because they understand the relationship between black and white. I remember um, he died, oh Lord, um, oh goodness, my brother, he died last year, actually, from heat exhaustion in Harlem, Ross, Ross McPherson. Yes. When Ross McPherson first came in, he didn't have a bachelor's degree, he didn't have a master's, he didn't have a doctorate, he died, he had just finished his doctorate of divinity. Um, when he came from Jamaica, he came to my house, mm -hmm. because the Maroon leadership told him to come to me. Mm -hmm. And he was coming to try and find a place to settle, and I helped him in Harlem. And he was given permission to publish poems, true Rasta poems, that mm -hmm. spoke to the Rasta cultural tradition. And if you look at Ross McPherson's works and his writings, the Rasta poetry that he published is different from, it's not reggae. Reggae is not Rasta. And I remember in 1992 when I was in the mountains with the, with the, with the, with the, um, the Maroon community and the Rasta community, they were very clear that Bob Marley was not a Rasta. Mm -hmm. And his music was not Rasta music, nor Rasta poems. And we had two days to try and settle that. So they accept that at the end of the day, that he um, advanced the cause of Rastafari, that he advanced the cause by popularizing us to the world. 
but let's not call him a Rasta because his behavior was not that of the Rastafari. And his poetry was not that of the Rastafari. And even though his poetry was very political, very powerful, Pan-African and strong. So we just need to make sure we understand history, right? So people don't play us with words and little games. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we look at a lot of the movements that came out of Jamaica, the Pokemon movement and some of the other movements and the people who went to Jamaica and did join the Rasta community, then you got to go back to the blacks who was taken by the British after the Revolutionary War to Jamaica, who founded the Pokemon movement in Jamaica, coming out of the Black Baptist movement in Savannah, what is now Savannah, Georgia, which predated the AME Church in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that community was also settled as free blacks in Trinidad, while Trinidad was still in slavery. Mm -hmm. And you can go to their homes and their places today. And they had quite an impact and quite an influence on the culture of Trinidad. These are African Americans who had been here for a couple of hundred years and had formed an African American identity. And so some of them went to, the northern ones went to um, Canada, mm -hmm. um, Nova Scotia, and then to Sierra Leone. But those who fought in the southern sector went to Jamaica and Trinidad. And nobody talks about them and the influence they had on the culture in Jamaica and Trinidad, both politically and economically. So before people start talking, play this little game history because of their alliance with certain white folks, especially the Jewish community in New York, who um, used them to build the Democratic Party to attack and destroy the black Republican Party base in Harlem and Bed-Stuy. Let them tell us the true history. Don't tell me J. Raymond Jones was the great box. Tell me J. Raymond Jones was the insurgent that was helped to get Jewish control politically over Harlem and destroyed the African-American political base, which was the, the, the Republican Party coming out of Lincoln. But we don't want to go there. That's enough on that. Let people chew on that and do what they want to do. Let's talk about the history of my people, your people, the African-American people. We fought a war in America. They call it the Civil War. That was our war of liberation. 300,000 of us wore the blue uniform, and a half a million of us fought in the war and didn't wear any kind of uniform. Mm -hmm. behind the lines. Mm -hmm. We won that civil war. That's our war of liberation. Mm -hmm. And no one wants to talk about the extent to which we won the civil, what was called the civil war. If you remember, the Battle of Gettysburg was fought in Pennsylvania. That's north of Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. So the South had already just about surrounded Washington when Lincoln said, we better bring the niggas in the game. That's when they decided to bring, to bring black troops in because they could not win the war. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until the introduction of black troops formally in the north, from the north that we began to win the war going towards Virginia. Mm -hmm. And then black troops was already fighting in, in the west and in the south because the Union general had recruited us when we left the plantation to fight for them and with them. <laughs> Many of us were carrying our saboteur work behind the lines, espionage work behind the lines. We had Harry Tubman working as literally the foundation of what would become the American CIA behind the lines. He had mm -hmm. one of the best intelligence network in the country. Mm -hmm. Even during that period, there were over 200 and two point, something like about two to 300,000 free blacks in America before the Civil War. And most of them was in Mississippi. One of the wealthiest men in Natchez uh, Mississippi was a black man who was a barber and a blacksmith. And uh, so we need to study African-American history and stop dealing with white stereotypes. Well, how could that be, that you had over 200,000 free blacks in Mississippi? No, in America. In America, The okay. largest segment of that okay. Okay. was in Mississippi. Okay, I got you. Um, and because we were the artisans, we were the craftsmen, you know? And so they were, and the, and the slavery system in America was one of the most brutal in the world, but it also had a back door to it. If you were skilled, and the white folks needed your, your skilled trade, <laughs> they weren't going to use let slavery keep you from applying that trade to help them build their society. So many blacks who were like blacksmiths, who were plumbers, who were architects, they were granted their freedom mm. while in the South. You know, and, and they were you allowed to work, or if they were on a certain plantation, plantation owner said, well, I'll let you go out to help Mr. George Vanderbilt build his plantation, and um, 
you can keep 20% of what, what, what they have to pay me for your labor. Mm -hmm. And so that black man would use that money to buy himself out of freedom. How much of them? And then, then buy his family. Is that many blacks, and especially Mississippi, had bought themselves out of freedom, and then they bought their family, because you had the only family. You couldn't have people. So if I was free, I had to buy my wife and buy my son, and they were legally my slaves. Mm. You understand? Under the law. But we were free to run our own plantation. There were many black plantations in the South, mm -hmm. run by black people. Mm -hmm. yeah. We were just in the South. Tucson, I mean, Dessaline was um, bought by from his white slave owner by a black plantation slave owner in Haiti. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he took the name, and he, he took the name Dessaline from the black man. Mm -hmm. So this was something that was happening throughout the system. Mm -hmm. But remember, America is bigger than any of the Caribbean islands, bigger than most of the Caribbean islands put together. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about the United States, you're talking about an enormous piece of geography with very cultural stuff going on mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. You're talking about a population in Florida around St. Augustine, around an encampment called Fort Moses that had been there since the 1500s. It was an African free town and one of the biggest forts in America. And when it was attacked by Andrew Jackson, he came back and told the President of the United States that this is part of what's in the Library of Congress. You send me to fight Indians and all I was fighting is niggas down in Florida. Mm -hmm. Because that's what that was the, the largest maroon community out in this hemisphere outside of Brazil. Jamaica notwithstanding. The mm -hmm. Jamaican commu maroon community was small mm -hmm. compared to the African American maroon community, which is Florida. Mm -hmm. Can you even after the Civil War, many of them didn't stay in the United States. Some went to the uh, Bermuda, and some went to the Bahamas, and some went to the Dominican Republic. There's a city in the Dominican Republic, I forgot the name, but they speak English as the first language, not Spanish. Those are the descendants of those who left the United States after the Civil War, because they did not want to become, when Florida became a state, they did not want to become a part of the United States. Many other went to the, the Bahamas, and you find there's a couple of islands in the Bahamas that's all African-American historical sites and places. Same thing with, with, with uh, Bermuda. Mm -hmm. But no one talks about these histories. So come back to the Civil War. But be, before you, uh, and I do want you to deal with that Civil War, but when, while, while you're talking about the uh, African American Maroons, uh, Florida, uh, I can't have, listen, the Seminoles, can you, I mean, you the have. Seminoles, there's no such Native American group called the Seminoles. The Seminole was a nation of the Creek Indians and Africans that had genetically amalgamated. But, the, you know, the white man couldn't say that they were Africans. That's why I pointed out when Andrew Jackson was sent to fight the Seminole at Fort Moses in his report back to, I think, President Buchanan, he said, you sent me to fight Indians, and I, I found that I was only fighting niggas. Okay. And this is Andrew Jackson, who would uh, become the president of the United States. Right. And I think it was, uh, what, two-thirds of the American army uh, was engaged in trying to put down... Uh, and they were defeated handily by that community, which was an African community. That we had been escaping into Florida ever since the 1500s. I belong to a nation that's, if you look at me, you can see I'm more Native American than African. Mm -hmm. um, my community is called the Chikora Nation. Mm -hmm. The Chikora Nation live in what is now Pauley's Island, South Carolina, Merrill's Inlet, South Carolina, Georgetown, South Carolina. In the 1520s, the Spanish came up from the Dominican Republic and they settled in Paula's Island, South Carolina. They had pulled a coup. They captured a lot of our chiefs and invited a lot of our chiefs onto the boat, supposedly for a powwow, and then they captured them. While they were capturing our chief on one ship, the Africans rebelled and burned down two, the other two ships and escaped into the community with the Chikora Nation. That is the genesis of my African experience in North America. Mm -hmm. On the other side of my family, my family would come from the, the Rwanda, Burundi area. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was a Tutsi, great grandfather was a Tutsi man, one of the last people to be enslaved in the slavery at the slave market in Georgetown, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So we have a very, and, and during that entire period, there's a place down there now, there was a place called Beth Village. 
which is on the Atlantic Ocean between Paul the Salvin Beach and Debbie Du Beach. That was an African American maroon community that much of my grandfather's people come from. And then further up, about 20 miles, you had another community called, today they call it Burgess. That was the biggest maroon community. This is just in one little spot in South Carolina, in Georgetown and Holy County. And they never gave up. We were called the Freewood Niggas. That's what they call us, the Freewood Niggas. Because mm -hmm. maroon is a Spanish term. And that was used in Jamaica because Jamaica was settled by the Spanish before the English. Mm -hmm. So they kept some of the Spanish term. Mm -hmm. But uh, the Spanish term for the runaway but was maroon. Um, and, and, and the Portuguese area, they were called the Cimarron. Um, but in North America, we were called the Freewood Niggas. Mm -hmm. So if you go to a place like North Santee, where some more of my family's from, that's the Freewood Niggas. If you go to Burgess, that's the Freewood Niggas. You go to Old Beth Village, that's where the Freewood Niggas was. And we actually traded Beth Village with the white folks um, in the 1920s, just before the 1920s. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. gave up the land we had on the beachfront for farmland beside a new highway they were building called Ocean Highway, which is now Highway 17. And we built three distinct towns that still are towns. One's called Simmonsville, one's called Fort. Simmonsville and Marysville, which is about a quarter mile apart, that's all the small family. Two whole towns. That's mm -hmm. our family. Mm -hmm. African Native American peoples. Mm -hmm. And then you go further up, you got Parkersville and Fraziersville. Those are the other two black maroon communities that traded their land, the maroon lands, to come by the highway where they could get their goods to market. Mm -hmm. And so till today, our people still live in these areas. Mm -hmm. um, but nobody, you know, I guess we haven't written it. People talk about the Gullah Geechee culture. Some white folks come up with this concept and try to settle us just on the island. The majority of the Gullah Geechee people live on the mainland, not the island. Mm -hmm. You know, the islands, yes, are more isolated in some ways, but some of these communities on the mainland is even more isolated than the islands. Mm -hmm. My oldest daughter, mother, God bless her soul, um, Barbara was Native American, but she was not from the West and she was not Asiatic. She was Afro-Asian Native American, and they lived on an island called Sandy Island, which is a big freshwater island that sits between the PD River and the Waccamaw River. Mm -hmm. Till this day, only mm -hmm. Black and their native cousins still live there on this island. And a few years ago, we uh, were doing petitions up here to save. This white man bought one plot from one of our cousins, Mr. Frazier, who was an undertaker, and he wanted to build a bridge over there to get to his land. So we went to court because there's a little hummingbird there, and he only nestles on that island. And so we went to court to save the habitat of this hummingbird. The judge ruled in our favor, but not in favor of the hummingbird. He said the bridge would destroy the, the essence of the African and Native culture that is there, and heritage that is there, which is a better ruling than the ruling for the hummingbird. Mm -hmm. So the bridge never got built. You can only get there by ferry boat. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I um, wanted to extend this dialogue is because you look at Florida today, the killings in Florida. I mean, but I, you know, it's all over America, but there's, there's history that goes all the way back in terms of the resistance movement yeah, and it's why... It's been all across the country. Florida was the biggest maroon community, but it was by far the only one. And so, but we don't want to just dwell there. Let's, we, let's, we resisted everywhere in America. That's we good. We resisted in Boston, we resisted in New York. One of the first rebellion in this country was burned when we burned New York down in 1712. Now, they claim only a few blacks were killed. It doesn't matter whether everybody. one got killed. We of uh, we burned New York to the ground, 1712. Second uh, year or so before that, we had the rebellion the, in South Carolina, where your people are from, up near the, 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 the Stoner River, yes. near Walterboro, South Carolina. Right. One of the biggest rebellions ever in North America. They don't even know what the number was, because most of the people escaped into Florida. They captured the leadership and the critical soldiers who stayed behind while the others escaped and fought the British militia, and they hung them. And it was led by a brother named, um, 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 oh, Lord. And they played drums and carried a flag. I wish I knew what that flag was they were carrying. Mm -hmm. um, the brother from the sound of his name, I remember it sounds Ghanaian. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, that was Yeah, it skips my mind, done. too, and I know what you're um, talking but about. But the majority of people in South Carolina at that point had come from Angola and the Congo. But we mm -hmm. had a few from West Africa. The majority was from Angola and the Congo. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, the very word Angola is where the whites mispronounce as Cree as the Gola people, 
other Gullah people, as you say mm-hmm. today. So mm-hmm. they were talking about the people from Angola. Mm-hmm. Oh, the people didn't say Angola like we said today. They said Ngola. Ngola. Mm-hmm. So that's where the white man got Gullah from. Mm-hmm. So, but that's notwithstanding, is all of those things are significant. Like history has said, if done in real time, we could be talking about one month or a month, but we can't right. do that. We got to take episodes from the epic, mm-hmm. that we, the episodes that we think are significant. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things we know that it was the black soldiers that fought most of the critical battles of the Civil War, from Fort Pillow where we got massacred by the whites to the major battles in South Carolina where we stopped them to, 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 to Richmond, Virginia, to many of the battles in the West you find that it is the colored soldiers, the African-American soldier, that is leading many of these, of the troops who are, who are leading the assaults in these major battles. And what is criminal about white American power elite, after the war, if you had hundreds of thousands of black soldiers and they didn't know how to integrate them back into the community because these people now know how to kill white people. Mm-hmm. You listen to this clearly now. Mm-hmm. You got hundreds of thousands of black men all of them on a rifle and a pistol, getting out of the military, going back to New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Baltimore. They said, oh, hell no. So what did they do with those soldiers? Dispatch them to the West. And they're known in the West as what? The Buffalo, the Buffalo soldiers. soldiers. But they dispatched them in the West to be killed off in the, in, the, in the Indian War. Many of them kept on going into Mexico and never stopped. Okay? They just mm-hmm. help it, and they just kept it moving. Um, many of them joined the Native Americans, and many of them stayed in the American military. But that wasn't something that they did on one occasion. They, did, they would do the same thing in the First World War. They would do the same thing in the Second World War with black soldiers who had fought in one theater in Europe, and then they send them to be killed off in another theater. Like my uncle fought with General Page, who was an advance guard of General Patton, and taken the Rhine. And my, mother, my uncle was famous down south for the amount of Nazis he killed and for the stab wound he took from a bayonet in his shoulder. He lived to be 96, but about to snow, he died a few years ago. Um, but when the, my father, my stepfather, who raised me and was my true father, fought also in Europe in the 92nd, mm-hmm. but what would become the 92nd, but they were all dispatched from Europe and not allowed to come back to America and send to the Pacific to fight the Japanese mm. to get them killed off. Mm-hmm. They would do the same thing in the Vietnam War under Johnson with the, the 82nd Paratrooper Division. Mm-hmm. They came home in the 60s to find themselves restricted to the base. They couldn't get off the base. Um, I think they did allow their families to come and see them on the base, but they couldn't have leave. And then they sent them back to Vietnam because they didn't know how to bring those paratroopers who had been in those bushes fighting and killing Vietnamese back into the streets of America during the rebellions of the 60s. So that's something, going back to the Buffalo Soldier, was a trend in the American political, military, industrial complex to murder off the black soldiers who had been engaged in combat and had learned warfare rather than let them come back into the black community. That's one of the consequences of the Civil War that we need to look at. But we need to look at some other simple things. Um, like I say, you can only do episodes from an epic. Mm-hmm. So one of the major episodes was a young man who fought in the, uh, he was in the Navy um, and during the Civil War. And he came out of the Navy and he was a draftsman. And he became, we know him in history as Louis Latimer. Right. He was a friend of a guy named um, Alexander Graham Bell. They were good friends. Alexander Graham Bell's father was dead. So Alexander Graham Bell was trying to create something for his father to hear when he stumbles up on the telephone. Mm. He was trying to create a hearing aid for his daddy. And so the guy who wrote the, the who did the drafts, who wrote, who did the um, draft, the first drawing, what, what do you call it? Um, when you draw the, when you draft. For the telephone, yeah, uh, uh, that was Louis Latimer right. doing it for Alexander Graham Bell. So when you look in the book and you see this drawing of the first telephone, that's not done by Alexander Graham Bell. That's done by his friend Louis Latimer. Mm-hmm. Latimer would then begin to work 
for as a draftsman with a company owned by a young white guy in New Jersey named Edison. And he was not a draftsman initially, he was the patent defender. Most of the defending of patents for the Edison company was done by Lewis Latimer. But Latimer wanted to be an inventor and a drafter. So the light bulb, which was not created by Edison, nor Lewis Latimer, was created by two British scientists. But they couldn't keep it burning more than a few seconds. But the concept they sold to Bell, I mean to um, Edison, Edison didn't know what to do with it, so he gave it to this young black guy who wanted to go do more than just be a patent defendant. And so what uh, Louis Latimer did, he remembered that when they were picking cotton and what the, the people would do to keep their hands warm, they would burn the cotton seeds. And how it would just glow and glow and glow like it would never burn out. So that's how he come up with the carbon filament. Mm. that made the incandescent light bulb a practical tool which then allow Americans to begin to work 24 hours a day, light their streets, light their homes, and now factories that had to close at sunset could work right through the night. Because now you have this artificial lighting called the incandescent light bulb. It created a revolution in the world. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And then you had, um, what's our brother name, who created wrote the, the blueprint for the first street lighting for New York, for Paris, and for London. So if you think of what he did in America um, when he created the, the, the gas mask and the street light. Mm -hmm. But um, he also did street lights for London and Paris. And Morgan? Uh, no. Garrett Morgan. Garrett Morgan. So all of this is occurring right after the Civil War. Mm. You understand? And, and these black people who were enslaved, these are the children of the formerly enslaved, one generation out. And at the same time, we have the, the federal troops was in the South protecting blacks, so most of the, con most of the people who elected to, the, to Congress and to state government throughout the Southern states who was in rebellion are now black immediately after the Civil War, the first five years after the Civil War, and they're rebuilding the South. Mm -hmm. But then we are betrayed by the white northern businessmen. And there's a good book. It's called Complicity that mm -hmm. people can buy. Complicity mm -hmm. um, on how the white businessmen conspired with those who would become the Ku Klux Klan in the South to sell the blacks out in exchange for them to be given national political leadership under Rutherford B. Hayes so the American banking industry could control the economy of America. Mm -hmm. And so they pardoned then all of the war criminals in the Civil War and gave them their citizenship back, moved the troops out of the South, allowed the terrorist organization, the Klan, to rise to then declare war on the free black population that for the most part had been disarmed and left unprotected by the federal government of the United States. End of the period that was called Reconstruction. That was a betrayal by our government, but it didn't stop us. We still kept on going. Between 19, 1865 and 1929, African Americans opened 75 banks, 100 plus insurance companies, okay? Mm -hmm. From a couple of thousand schools, mm -hmm. nearly 100 colleges, and a couple of thousand of what you call benevolent association or what they call penny association, today we call credit unions. Mm -hmm. And we built black business districts all over America. The most famous one is Greenwood in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which was attacked by the white government and the white community in 1921, I think, and burned to the ground. But the same thing happened uh, 10 years later in Rosewood, Florida, which was another black thriving community. The same thing had happened a few years earlier in Wilmington, North Carolina, where the black elected officials were driven out of town by armed rebellion on the part of the whites. Their homes and businesses were burned to the ground. It uh, also happened outside of Raleigh, North Carolina, in a place we call Little Haiti, which was another thriving free black community burned to the ground. It also happened in East St. Louis, okay, which is called the Great Riots of East St. Louis. These are white folks rioting, coming and burning the black business district down. 
and it happened in other places, but these are the more famous ones. Mm -hmm. And yet we still thrive. Mm -hmm. From coming out of the Civil War to 1929, we have seized 15 million acres of land. Mm -hmm. We've lost most of that between the 1929 and now. I think we only own some like 5 million acres out of the 15 million acres we seized after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in that period of time, we built hospitals, colleges, schools, and so forth. And some of the great leaders that were struggling up to that day, one of the greatest of all was the man we know as Booker Telefer in Washington. There is no black leader greater than him in North America. Not Marcus Garvey, not Malcolm X, not Booker T. Washington. Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, and Booker T. Washington had the benefit of the press in a certain way. Let's see Dr. King and Malcolm. But Booker T. Washington left us Tuskegee University. Booker mm -hmm. T. Washington held the first Pan-African Congress. Nobody gives him credit for it. Most, most people don't know this man, Booker T. Washington, held a conference at Tuskegee University um, ooh, 1915, 1914? Yeah, 1914, um, I think. 1914, and it was called a Conference of the Negro World. Mm -hmm. Africans came from Nigeria, they came from Ghana, they came from Jamaica, they came from uh, other parts of Central and South America to attend this conference to talk about economic politics and culture and development in the African world. This is before the first Pan-African Congress conference in England. Then that first Pan-African conference in England, guess what? Mr. Booker T. Washington got on the ship, went over to England and helped to sit down and plan that conference and then came back to America and put the power of the Tuskegee machine behind promoting that conference. This is before W. Du Bois really gets involved. Mm, mm, mm. During this period, Mr. Booker Washington is communicating with a young man from Jamaica, a young printer named Marcus Messiah Garvey. Because the conference at Tuskegee in 18, 1914, about six to 10 Jamaicans had come, but Garvey couldn't come because the British wouldn't let him leave because they saw him as an agitator. And so Bagabi gets the report back from these others. So Garvey and Booker is writing each other. I read those letters when I was a young man. Booker T. Washington III, his grandson, was in Malcolm X OAAU along with myself. And we lived only two buildings apart, so I would be in his basement for hours and hours reading letters, which is now in the Schomburg Library, mm -hmm. um, from between Booker Washington and Marcus Garvey. And so when Garvey came to America, he initially told Booker he wanted to come and teach at Tuskegee and bring his ideas there. And Booker told him, no, you can't bring those ideas down there. This is the South. You got to take these ideas in the Northeast where you'll be safe. Mm -hmm. So Garvey, when Garvey got here, Booker Washington had died. And I contend that Booker Washington was murdered by the establishment. Mm, of um, course. He was invited to New York to come to a meeting, supposedly a peace meeting, to broker a peace between him, Monroe Trotter, um, W.B. Du Bois and some others and some white folks. He got sick at this meeting mm -hmm. and they put him into St. Luke's Hospital. He never recovered. He sent a telegram home to his wife and his aide saying, come and get me. If I'm going to die, I'd like to die in my beloved Tuskegee. Mm -hmm. But he died on the train, on the train pulling to the station in Baltimore, Maryland, on the way back to Tuskegee. Most people don't even know where this man died. Mm -hmm. you know? And it's clear he was poisoned. But there was nobody doing an autopsy in those days in that sort of thing. And so his body was taken home and buried. Mm -hmm. um, so Garvey would get here a few months later, and his great friend, Mr. Booker T. Washington, who he was in partnership with, had been killed. And so Garvey said he came here to implement the Tuskegee model, the program of Booker T. Washington. And for people to discuss Garvey and never mention Booker T. Washington, it is a crime. And that means you didn't even reach Tony Martin's book on Garvey. Because if you had read Tony's book, Tony would have told you these things that I'm now telling you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tony Martin, God bless his soul, who has gone on to an ancestor now. And he wrote his, his new book, and an extraordinary book he did, is on the history of the Caribbean. Everybody must get that book. And I don't know what my copy is, but right now my head is spinning. <laughs> I hope I didn't loan it out. Um, the, there are some other figures during that period of time that's significant. These are pre-Garvey figures, okay? And one was a man that worked with Booker T. Washington. 
His name is T. Thomas Fortune. Yes. Okay. He ran the biggest news, black newspaper in America, based in New York, before the African World, which is Garvey's newspaper, who he would become the editor of mm -hmm. in the UNIA. Mm -hmm. But he was a newspaper editor running a black newspaper before Garvey got here. And you know what the name of his organization was? The Afro-American League, formed mm -hmm. in 1892 in Rochester, New York. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then you had Martin Delaney. Martin Delaney was a major in the Civil War in the Union Army. That's right. You know, he was born free. His father, I think, and mom had escaped from slavery or bought their way out of slavery. Mm -hmm. um, after the Civil War, he found out from his grandfather, who was enslaved, that the grandfather had come from a place in Nigeria called Abiokuta. Mm. Abiokuta is the, an area that's significant for African Americans because many of us came from there. And it is clear now in the most recent genetic studies that 64% of the genetic structure of African Americans is Yoruba. Mm. Okay. That's very significant. Um, and so Martin Delaney, after the Civil War, got on a ship, went to Nigeria, went to Abiokuta. He formed an organization called the Niger, Valley, Niger River Valley Association. And he bought land, thousands of acres of land was given to him to bring us back home to Africa. Mm -hmm. Gabi isn't in the picture yet. Mm -hmm. But when he came back to the country, his youngest boy was dying. And so he fought to save his child's life. And one of the things that was a consequence of that, he went to medical school at uh, uh, Harvard University, along with three other blacks. And four weeks before their graduation from medical school, the crackers said, we're not marching with no niggas. So they were kicked out of Harvard Medical School four weeks before graduation. Mm -hmm. But he went on to be a physician, and he moved to Charleston, South Carolina, and became one of the major leaders in helping blacks organize to move to Liberia. Garvey mm -hmm. is on the scene now. Mm -hmm. Then you need to meet Bishop MacNeil Turner. Absolutely. Again, free Garvey, African American nationalist, Pan Africanist, who, one of his best statements is like, You've never seen the Chinese use a black god or, or a non Chinese god of white people. So he was telling black folks, If you walk into any place of worship, your god should be black. Mm -hmm. And he was clear about this. He was another one of them South Carolina boys. South mm -hmm. Carolina put out a lot of very powerful brothers. Mm -hmm. And so when you study Bishop McNeil Turner and the work he did in Liberia and the work he did here, and all of these brothers were involved in some degree in the first Pan-African con conference. Mm -hmm. okay. Booker T. Washington, before he died, had set up the, the Togo project. People said, oh, he was over there helping the Germans. No, all of Africa, West Africa, was conquered by some European. Anywhere he go, there's going to be some cracker. Britain was run suddenly French. Germany was running Togo. He was trying to come up with a way that Africans could be self-sufficient. So he came up with a strain of cotton that would grow well in Togo and hoping that the Africans would use that to develop themselves economically. Of course, the German colonialists dominated it too, so he pulled his program out. Mm -hmm. But people blame him, oh, you went over and helped the Germans. He didn't go read the writing. He didn't go over to help the Germans. He was trying to give the Africans a way to get themselves out of what was perceived poverty at that time under the dominance mm -hmm. of the Germans. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Gabi wasn't here yet. Mm -hmm. okay. The AME Church had already built its headquarters in, 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 in Liberia. Prince Hall had built its headquarters in Liberia. Liberia had already been built. It was a nation state. Sierra Leone was built and it was a nation state. Both of these things were built by African Americans going back to Africa before Garvey was born. So how did Garvey get to be the father of the Back to Africa movement? Talk about uh, well, let's get those two states. states. Did you understand that? I, I understood. That's why I want and you I to want talk about them and, 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 and their structure because it is it, presented as if the Europeans negotiated that, set that up, and put Africans there as a colonial uh, uh, real estate for them. No, the Europeans wanted to get rid of Africans. The, 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 many of the people we call abolitionists, they, Liberia was a, a, a project that they were trying to use to get rid of 
the free black population in America. Mm -hmm. Remember, mm -hmm. Liberia starts before the Civil War. The, 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 the crackers wanted to get rid of the free black population because mm -hmm. the rest of us was locked down in slavery. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to get rid of the free black population. And that's why that was started. But it wasn't started as a colonial project. Colonialism was the only political methodology of the day. So what mm -hmm. else are you you gonna how else are you gonna design it? But the black folks who went had to pay their own passage. You know, mm -hmm. they had to um pay provide their own food to last them for a certain amount of months until they could grow a crop and get a crop out of the ground, etc. And in many cases they were bamboozled and double crossed. I don't forget it was a society, benevolent society founded in New York just to take care of the blacks whose money was stolen from them and they never got a passage on a boat. And they'd already sold whatever little land they had and chickens and goat or cows or whatever. And they were stranded in New York hungry and empty because the white people had robbed them. Mm -hmm. But many of us made it to Liberia. Many of us died because we paid for two months food supply and got them found we only had one month's food supply. So people, I've got the history of Liberia downstairs if they want to read it. Mm -hmm. We didn't go there. We bought that land from other Africans who were, many of those chiefs were selling other Africans into slavery. Mm -hmm. And they sold us the worst land. Liberia was the swamp, the mangrove swamps, the, the, the super infested malaria swamp. They didn't even sell us good land. Mm -hmm. Okay, But we turned it into something because mm -hmm. we wanted to be free. People didn't care mm -hmm. what the cost. They wanted to leave America and go back home. Mm -hmm. But they no longer spoke their language. They didn't know what part of the continent their grandfather or great-grandfather came from. They just wanted to get back to Africa. Mm -hmm. So that's where they landed. Mm -hmm. Sierra Leone was the same way. The black folks who fought with the British was taken to Nova Scotia. The British promised them land and then after the American Revolution. The British lost the war. So they took the blacks. They did take those who fought with them to Nova Scotia. But when they got to Nova Scotia, the crackers in Nova Scotia wouldn't give them land and started the same racist triping that went on in America. So the blacks said, then take us back to Africa. So the British hired a black man named um, Paul okay. Coffey. Mm -hmm. And he took that population from Nova Scotia and a good population of free blacks under the Wilberforce Foundation in England. And they settled the area that's called Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone would blow up. Because what the British would do whenever they captured a slave ship after the British declared transatlantic slave trade to be illegal, all the ships that the British captured, they would take those people to Sierra Leone. And that's how Sierra Leone gets to be such a multi-ethnic place. Most of the people they took to Sierra Leone were Yoruba. Matter of fact, the name Yorubas began to be applied to them in Sierra Leone. They weren't called Yorubas when they were in Ni what is now Nigeria, which is another story people need to learn. But that notwithstanding, mm -hmm. understand all of this is going on and there is no Marcus Garvey yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understand? So when Marcus Garvey gets to America and his friend Booker T. Washington have been killed, he tries to carry on the program that Booker T. Washington was calling his Tuskegee model and Garvey merged his ideas with Booker's ideas and that became what bloomed into the UNIA. But the, the element in the UNIA that if you don't understand her, you won't have any UNIA. And it's a black American woman, a school teacher, and an actress. They call her the elocutionist in those days. Her name is Henrietta Benton Davis. Mm -hmm. And she's the number two person in the UNIA. And any picture of the UNIA leadership, you see this group of men, and there's one woman standing in the middle. That's Henrietta Benton Davis. Mm -hmm. She spoke French, Portuguese, Spanish, and English. And she was the one going all over Central South America organizing the UNIA chapters because she spoke all of the languages. Mm -hmm. And she was the one, because of her role in the AME Church, that used the AME Church to give Marcus Garvey a foundation to move around the country. The AME Church was the platform from which he was speaking and organizing all around America. And that's why he was able to do so rapidly and so successfully. And so she was the lady when the Black Star Lodge line was launched, she was the president of the Black Star Corporation mm -hmm. and was on that ship on its maiden voyage when it was captured by the white folks in Jacksonville, Florida and held in port until they ran out of food and everything else under the suspicion that there was two blacks who escaped from the chain gang in Jacksonville and they were afraid if the ship left, they might be stowaways on the ship 
and they were escaped, and that was the rouse to break the black star line. Mm. And many of the Negroes blame Henrietta for that. How could she do anything about that? She was seized by the government and the police and the army in Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. And when they finally let them off the ship, because people started protesting, we've been on the ship for a month, we got to be out of food, we have this, um, and blame the, the, the Black Star Company for it, when it's the government of the United States and the, and the law enforcement people in Jacksonville, Florida, working under the behest of the then J. Edgar Hoover. Mm. And that's that thing mm. that we have that turn on us so viciously, sometimes more vicious than the real white man. Mm. Yeah. You know? So um, I wanted to talk about them because then there are others. In that same period, you got a fantastic lady named Ida B. Wells. Oh, Lord, yes. Who's fighting against yes. lynching in America. Yes. There's a sister who, um, what's the name of the town that Ida was from? Um, but down in Mississippi. But anyway, it's two brothers had to open a grocery store. Because the white grocery store in the black community was selling garbage for high prices. So these brothers opened their own grocery store and were selling good food at good prices. And they took all the business from the white man. So the white folks came and tried to shoot them up, and they defended themselves, and they killed a couple of white folks. And so they were arrested and put in jail, and then they were lynched after they were put in jail um, by a mob. So Ida B. Wells, who was a journalist, wrote about all of this in her newsletter. Mm -hmm. And then her office was attacked and firebombed and burned down. And she had to escape from home and come into Chicago and for safety. And she started a campaign that took all over the world, France, England, Germany, um, telling the world about lynching and murder and genocide in North America. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. This is pretty godly. Um, the the, the Afro-American League started by T. Thomas Fortune. Mm -hmm. Most of the members of the Niagara movement, including W. Du Bois, comes out of that movement. Mm -hmm. To found the Niagara movement. Mm -hmm. Movement was a reaction in some ways against the formation of Omega Phi, was Omega Psi Phi, the group we know as the Boule, mm -hmm. which is the black, light-skinned, professional elite, doctors and lawyers out of Philadelphia, who felt that they had no class association for themselves because they weren't allowed to mix with the white elite. And they felt they were above the rest of the black community, so they created a, the first Greek-lettered black organization in America, what we know as the Boule, so that they could have their own debutante cotillions and their own elite thing. And so there was a fight at that time about what we would be called, Negroes, this, this fight, talk we have now, but we're going to be called Negroes, colored, Afro-Americans, Sudanese, Ethiopians, all of these were discussions at that time. So the Niagara movement was the militant aspect of the black movement. But then that's when something happened in the South. A Jew named Frank was lynched. Um, he was a Jewish travel salesman, or post, or um, what do you call it, an insurance salesman, traveling mm -hmm. salesman, one of those, who was lynched in Georgia for the raping of a young white girl in a warehouse. There was a black man also arrested who was the janitor in one of these warehouses, but they didn't, they let the black man go, and they, 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 they captured the Jewish guy, took him to jail, and a mob came and lynched him. His name was Brown, I think. Um, but at any rate, mm -hmm. that's when the Jews formed the Anti-Defamation League. Mm -hmm. And they came to the black folks and formed a partner organization mm -hmm. called the NAACP. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the NAACP, the only black person in the leadership was W.B. Du Bois, mm -hmm. who was then, I think, um, the secretary. All the rest of the officers of that, that organization were white folks. Mm -hmm. So they were using black folks, and they would use black folks for the next coming decades as cannon fodder to change laws in America that would favor Jewish um, immigration into the South and development in the South. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? And once that those laws and stuff was passed, the same Jewish population who profited so much from integration and desegregation were turned against the African-American population in their partnership with the white Southern business and cultural community. Mm -hmm. But we need to understand that period. But during that same period, you had, before Marcus Garvey, the development of one of the biggest 
banks in America, black or otherwise, under the leadership of a woman named Maggie Walker in Richmond, Virginia. Mm -hmm. She started the St. Luke Benevolent Association a few years earlier. And by the night, by the 1929, when the stock market crashed, Margaret Walker's bank was so significant and so wealthy, wealthy that she was able to loan money to the major white banks in Richmond to keep them afloat. Mm. She also started one of the first department stores in America that was run by all black women. Nobody talks about it anymore. Mm -mm. When Black Wall Street was burned down, W.B. Du Bois organized with others, she got Ms. Fortune and others, to one of the biggest march in America to that date, down Fifth Avenue, which was called the Silent March. And it was all financed by Madam C.J. Walker. Mm -hmm. So you need to understand these things of our history if you're going to truly understand where Garvey fits. Garvey comes in the middle of all of that. Mm, mm. And many of those players that I just told you about that's already run an organization, already involved in Pan-Africanism abroad, already traveled to Africa, already involved in building in Africa, these people would all join up with Mr. Garvey because they didn't see Garvey as a threat or as an alien. Garvey said, I came to um, further and implement Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee model. Now, many of these people had fought against Booker Washington, like Monroe Trotter, who was the brother who was very strong, very powerful uh, journalist who fought against Booker because he thought Booker was an accommodationist. Mm -hmm. You know, Trotter, and if he was to look at it today, I'm sure he would change his mind. But Trotter was a very militant brother. And when he went to the White House to meet with President Wilson and another and a black delegation around the movie The Birth of a Nation, he got so up in the president's face, he had to seek the service through the brother out of the White House <laughs> <laughs> and said he would never be welcome back there again, you know. So, you know, you had some bad brothers back in that period between the end of the Civil War and 1929. And people need to study that period because it was an extraordinary developmental period for black people. We seized 50, 50, 50 million acres of land mm. in that period. We opened over 75 banks. We opened over uh, a thousand credit unions. We opened something like 50, 60 or more insurance companies. We opened thousands of schools, one room classrooms across the country. We opened multiple colleges across mm -hmm. the country. Mm -hmm. um, we were graduating people who were doctors, people who were lawyers. We were graduating um, people who were school teachers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Who, who, we weren't welcome in the white schools in most of America. So we created our own nation within America. Mm -hmm. It was that nation that would come under attack in the civil rights movement. The, the integration movement was about destroying that black nation economically and politically. And it succeeded because mm -hmm. we got bamboozled and fell for the okie doke. Mm -hmm. Even Black Wall Street. I went out last year to Tulsa, Oklahoma to celebrate Black Wall Street. I marched through the streets. I went all over the places where our brothers and sisters fought and died. I went to all their memorials. They had a wonderful time. The people there were beautiful. And the one thing that people told me, they said, Professor Small, I was a keynote speaker at the AME Church that was one of the only few churches that didn't get burned down, headed by a black woman who supported the movement. And they said, what the, they don't tell the world is that we rebuilt Black Wall Street, better than before. No, I didn't know. Nobody knows that. Then they say, but we lost it all with integration. We mm. rebuilt it better than before. But we lost it all with integration. How did integration thread its poison? Through the church. Through the Jews and their money and the churches. That's Explain. Why I was led by the people. Explain. I'm not going to go into detail. That's another whole lecture. Okay. I'm, I'm, it's the, the suffice. The black churches was leading that movement. The money that funded it and the newspapers that was rejecting it were primarily the Jewish and the white left. And we fell for it. You didn't see Chinese integration as the integration. 
We didn't see Italians ask for integration. The only person who asked for integration was us. To integrate what? Into something other than yours. What does that then say about your institution? That means they will be abandoned. And they were. Mm. When I grew up in the South, I didn't go to a white anything. Our church was our movie theater every Wednesday night. Whatever mm. movie the white folks could see in town, Mr. Joe Bly and my grandfather had their projector, and we watched our movies from Hopalong Cassidy to whoever else right in our church on Acadia Plantation, St. Anne Baptist. We used to go to town to a movie, and it was we were upstairs, the Strand and the Palace, and uh, then our people said, no, we're not going to support that movie theater no more. It just stopped. Everything we went to were black at that time. Mm. Black restaurants. So, same thing when I, when I grew up. We but never somebody saw wanted to destroy that because the black economy had gotten so powerful. So that by the time we got to 1954, you hear about Brown versus the board. And mm -hmm. I know you've heard Alton talk about this. Yes. But I grew up and I remembered the Camden, South Carolina case, which is the oldest of the case. Mm -hmm. Camden, South Carolina versus the state of South Carolina. And what the Camden, it was about busing our children to better school, getting the money for busing. So what Camden, because I remember my minister, Reverend George Bessemer, was a part of that movement. Camden is not far from your home. That's right. And so what they were doing in Camden, they were asking for a proportional return of the dollar, meaning give us our tax money back and we will build our own school. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, look at you, wait a minute. George Peter County is black. <laughs> we get the tax money back, we won't have no money. Mm. You understand? So if you did the proportional return of the black tax dollar back to the black community, we could have built anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the, that case was sent before the Supreme Court, but it wasn't heard. The second case came up before the Supreme Court at the same time was Brown versus the Board of Education in Washington, D.C. Brown versus the Board, Washington, D.C. Asking for what? Proportional return of the dollar, the same as the Camden case. So the Jews who ran the NAACP got the daughter of the president of the NACP in Kansas to bring charges for integrating the Topeka, Kansas school. And in that case, which is also Brown versus the Board of Topeka, Kansas, was merged with the other two cases, but, but fought as though it was the Topeka case. And that's the one that they granted. Hmm. Dismissed the proportional return of the dollar. That didn't even get argued. What got argued is the integration, which became the 1954 decision. But that's not what the black people were fighting for. That was the case the white people put up. The other two was the case the black people put up. That's when the betrayal came into view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it went downhill from there. We thought we were going uphill, but it went downhill. Mm -hmm. Well, let's come back to that other period, and then we can end in that period between 1865 and 1929, because you saw a couple other things happening. Because of the terrorism in the South that had followed uh, the, the ending of um, pulling the troops out of the South um, after the Civil War, leaving us at the mercy of the Ku Klux Klan and the other terrorist organization, Red Shirts of Mississippi, and so forth, um, in South Carolina, Tillman and his Red Shirts, um, which was some of the other type of class organization, you had hundreds of thousands, if not millions of us, moved from the South into the North. Two major paths, one through the Midwest into Chicago, Detroit, and St. Louis area, and one through the Eastern Seaboard through Philadelphia, New York, and Boston. Mm -hmm. And so out of that movement will come what we call the Harlem Renaissance. Yes. Okay. But it wasn't just in Harlem. That same type of Renaissance took place in Chicago, in St. Louis, mm -hmm. probably more profoundly in Chicago and St. Louis than it did in New York. But because New York was the light of the world, mm -hmm. and it was blown up in another way. Mm -hmm. And so you get great people like a Langston Hughes. Um, you got Zora Neale Hurston. Mm -hmm. You got. Very. Um, it is all about great people who came out of what is called 
that that Harlem Renaissance period would come up that time. And it, it wasn't really a Harlem Renaissance because the Renaissance is a rebirth of something. Mm -hmm. So what they really don't want to deal with is that we were talking about an African-American Renaissance or an African Renaissance in America, not a Harlem Renaissance because we had never lived in Harlem before. So how was it a Renaissance for us? Harlem was a white suburban upper class community. We were fundamentally servants in that community but now they had abandoned that community to move up into what is now Westchester County, where I'm living now. And so that community was then left open for the new immigrants coming from the South, the new refugees, as I was led. And so um, what you saw there was an African Renaissance. Hmm. When we begin to go into our painting, our poetry, our history, our political ideology, our, our historical lecturing, that was an African rebirth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's not called that. But the same thing was happening in St. Louis. Same thing was happening um, in Chicago at the very same time. And, and no discussion of that on it. But the key thing, Marcus Garvey came here and became a part of a movement that already existed. And he brought some new elements to that movement. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the greatest elements he brought was his singular the singularity of our Africanness, you mm. know, um, the one African concept. And because the movement of the Pan-African conferences, those things are already going on. People moving back to Africa, that has been going on for almost a century. Um, people buying land in Africa, opening institutions like the Amity Church and Prince Hall in Africa, that's already going on when Garvey gets here. Mm. So he's not the father of the back to Africa movement. That's a myth. What he does he galvanized the, what would become the Pan-African movement into being the Pan-African movement. Mm. That should be what we give him the great credit for. Mm -hmm. And he was able to do that in partnership with African-Americans like T. Thomas Fortune um, and Henrietta Benton Davis and many others. But those were two key principal players, Benton Davis being the number two in charge. When Gabi goes to prison, you ask who's in charge, nobody can tell you because they don't want to admit it's an African-American woman in Henrietta Benton Davis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's why studying your history is significant and important because history tells you the truth. Mm -hmm. not, and remember, we're not doing history in real time. We're doing episodes from the epic that is our history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you understand that context, context of, of, of episodes from the epic, then it'll all make sense to you. And then you can see the partnership between the T. Thomas Fortune and Marcus Garvey, uh, Martin Delaney and Marcus Garvey. Um, what's the brother name? Uh, Magneil Turner and Marcus Garvey. Um, um, the one who's fighting with Booker T. Washington. Uh, uh, w. E. Du Bois. No, no, yeah, but Du Bois and Garvey. But, you know, but those fights wasn't that big. If you read Du Bois and Booker, people made the the, the, the difference between them, they blow that out now in today's history. But if you go back then, they had a, a couple of two skirmishes in the paper. You know, mm -hmm. the ugliest mm -hmm. skirmish was between the boys and uh, Garvey. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, the boys call him a monkey. Da, 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 da. The boys and Garvey was arguing over a most fundamental question. Garvey having a meeting with the Ku Klux Klan. And the boys and them objected to that as an insult and traitorous. Mm -hmm. um, same thing happened between Malcolm and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. A year or so before Malcolm was killed, Malcolm went to Georgia at Brother Shabazz's house for a meeting around some farmland that they were trying to purchase in the South. And the person who came to the meeting to negotiate that was um, the head of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, William David Weeks then, was uh, Bob Shelton, the Grand mm -hmm. Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Malcolm hit the ceiling so badly and so much so Elijah Muhammad barred him, barred him from ever going back to the South again. See? This is before he was ousted from the nation. So that kind of rift has been going on. You know, the Klan is looking at the nation. Well, we're separatists and y'all are separatists, so let's be partners. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so Garvey was being looked at it the same way. The Klan was saying, well, you want to separate from us. We want to separate from you. So we'll work with you. We'll give you some land and so forth and so on. So it wasn't a negative, but on the other hand, if you're an African-American fighting against Klan terrorism and murder and genocide, 
and any of your brothers having any kind of dealing with them comes off as being treacherous. Mm -hmm. So, but those are some of the things we have to study in literature, get a better understanding of. Um, I would just like to refer show people some literature. I think they really need to get into. You know, we showed mm -hmm. the the book by our beautiful sister. Um, Dr. Wright, um, who did a PhD at Temple on Booker T. Washington. Mm -hmm. It will be enlightening, it will blow your mind, it will show you that Booker Washington is a premier Pan-Africanist, and into the Back, Afri back to African movement, and him and Gavi was brothers, mm -hmm. comrades, mm -hmm. you know, not enemies, not antagonists. Mm -hmm. That's a myth that people have pushed among us. And then you will learn about a beautiful brother who in 19... 12. 1911. Remember, 1911, Garvey's not here yet. Mm -hmm. his, name, you know, his name was Noble Drew Ali. Yes. And he founds an organization called the Moorish Science Temple. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about we are the Moors of Africa. Mm -hmm. And that the history of North Africa and the history of Spain was our history. And that many of the people who were that was involved and those years of controlling North Africa and right down into West Africa and Spain and France were now enslaved in the United States of America, and he was trying to restore our identity. There's no garbage yet. And then my gorgeous, beloved sister, her name is Zora Neale Hurston. She, she wrote, their eyes were watching God. And then she wrote another book called Jonas Gord Vaughn. Zora Neale was an extraordinary uh, writer, anthropologist, and ethnologist during the Harlem Renaissance. She was so militant, they actually drove her out of New York City. And she went back down to La Florida. She ended up dying in poverty, of course, like many of us did in those days. But her writings are extraordinary when you want to look at African American culture and its linkages to Africa. Mm. And then if you really want to get deep, there's a brother who was one of my teachers, Hal Cruz, who helped me establish the structure for black studies at City College in uh, 1970. And this is one of his great books. And this one is called Plural But Equal, where he does an analysis of the civil rights movement and shows you who was behind it and what it was really about and how black people were betrayed. He wrote another book called The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. Mm. And so mm. we need to read Dr. Cruz. And then you need to read the biography of my beloved. I love this brother right here. Martin R. Delaney. Dr. Martin Delaney. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that great period of transitioning from the Civil War right into the 1920s. And of course, you cannot talk about America unless you're talking about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and his premier work as message to the black man. And it's sad, very sad, that every black American have not read this book because the white man used the fight between him and Malcolm to blind us to the true works and value of the Nation of Islam and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, which comes into being around 1929 after the death of Noble Drew Ali and the fall of the Maury Science Temple. And it would be Malcolm X in the 1950s that would bring this organization to its maturity and fruition and into the eyes of the world. Mm -hmm. But this book, Message to the Black Man, is an extraordinary document by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And during that period, um, of, of, of coming through the, the, 19, the, 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 the falling of the Stock market that this black man, like Margaret Walker, who built the great bank, this is the black man that built the first great uh, cosmetology industry following Madam C.J. Walker. But he, oh, Madam C.J. Walker didn't just have beauty shop, but she had beauty products. And Madam C.J. Walker had created a network that would become, you would know it later as, as um, is, it, is it Revlon, where they go from door to door? Selling those products. What was the name of that product? What's the other? Mary Kay is one of them. Mary Kay is a later one, but in between it. But that whole concept, that's what 
Madam C.J. Walker was doing. She trained her people at the school. But even before her, she was training in the school, a college, a black college in St. Louis, mm -hmm. where another sister, I forgot her name, who started this big cosmetology college in St. Louis. She was a nurse by mm -hmm. profession. And then you have this brother who started not only a department store in Chicago, but he had one of the, um, the biggest um, beauty products industry in America for a couple of decades. You know, mm -hmm. and um, he's very well known. That's S.D. Fuller. And so these black entrepreneurs, and, and if you want to look at some modern concepts, of course, you want to look at Polynomics um, by our, our brother, um, Claude Anderson. Claude Anderson. But another good book of his is called Black Label, White Wealth. And to do some research, this is an enormously wonderful book. It's called The African American Archive. No black home should be without this book. This book is just an absolute must that you own for your children in high school, elementary school, and especially college. The African American Archive. And then there's a, a couple of books that you must have. One is, 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 is written for the high school social studies uh, curriculum nationwide. It's called African American History, A Journey to Liberation. And this is by Dr. Malefi Asante, mm -hmm. along with many other black authors, including Dr. Rosalind Jeffries and others mm -hmm. who contributed to it. An extraordinary work will blow your mind, and it must be in every home. And there's another extraordinary textbook that's by Prentice Hall, believe it or not. Prentice Hall. It's called African American History. Next to the one by Malefi Asante, it's one of the most sterile history of African Americans dealing with major episodes out of our epic. And then I'm going to show you two more pieces. That's the latest, done by a very good friend of mine, Brother Mwalimu Suja. And his uh, daughter, Sister Kenya Suja. And this is called Volume 1 and Volume 2. And it's African American, African Cultural Heritage in North America. African Cultural Heritage in North America, Volume 1 and 2. You've got to get this. You can't say you know anything about our history unless you know about these books I'm showing you. And so when we think of African Americans just in that short period between the Civil War and the crash of 1929, the reason I use the crash of 1929, because after that, we will never recover in terms of the amount of banks we opened, because with the crash of 1929 is about the major European, the German, English, and American banking family getting control of the economy in America. It's right after that that they create the, the uh, Federal Reserve, which is not a government organization. It's an organization of a few rich banks and family from the House of Rothschild to the major bank in Germany and the banks in America that control the economy of the United States of America. And so after that point, black folks could not get the licensing and the charters to open banks. Hmm. And so we were able to pull off a few that was funded and financed by white banks like Freedom Bank in Harlem was underwritten by Chase Manhattan Bank and is a way for Chase to process the drug monies and the numbered monies in Harlem at the time. And once the CIA used the Cuban to take over the numbers industry, they had no more need for Freedom Bank and so it was allowed to fail and dissolve. And that happened in many other places in the country. So there's certain things we need to understand mm -hmm. about America and about Africans in America. Last year, we spent over a trillion dollars. That's more than all of the, any nation in Africa and more than any 10 together and more money than all but 11 countries in the entire world. So mm -hmm. African Americans would be the 12th richest nation in the world. We have wealth, we have riches, but we have not turned our riches into wealth. And that's where family organization, community organization, cultural organization, political organization, 
economic organization wrapped around our African-American identity comes in, because when we're able to do that, we'll be able to turn our riches into wealth. We will control the economic politics and culture where we live. It means the stores in our community will not be predominantly Arab, uh, Asian, Latino, or other foreign blacks, but they would be predominantly African-Americans. And if anybody else opened a store in our community that's not African-American and doesn't live in our community, they don't have to live there, but invest in our community, help support the institutions in our community, help build the daycare and the playgrounds and the health facilities in our community, help control the police in our community, then we should not shop there. And if we don't shop there, they will go out of business in a month. And so we just need to be clear. African-Americans should own the African-American community the way the East Indians own the East Indian community, the way the Chinese own the Chinese community, the way Latinos own the Latino communities, the way the Italian own the Italian community, the way the Jews own the Jewish, own the Jewish community. In those same regards, we should own the African-American community. And if you don't understand that, you are sicker than I thought you were. I mean, mm -hmm. Dr. Noble said that we are suffering from a shattered consciousness and a broken black identity. And I agree with that. But to fix that shattered consciousness, you gotta come to the common sense that says, if you can't control the economic politics and culture where you live, you're a slave of those who does. The archives is huge, it's 30,000 hours. Yeah, I mean, digitize it, organize it, and save it for African people.